Okay, we'll dismiss the children right now and get into the word. We're going to start in Hebrews 4, that very last scripture I gave you, Andrea. Have you ever had a scripture you didn't understand very well, and then when you start understanding, you're so happy about it? How many of you have a few scriptures you're still praying for more? Get excited. You know you have some of it, but... We're going to talk tonight about the rest of God. It is God's very best for us that no matter what's going on on the outside of us, that there's rest inside of us. Yeah. In the inside. Wow. We're going to start at Hebrews 4, verse 7. He, the Lord, again fixes a certain day today, saying through David after so long a time. Just as has been said before today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. Now, what does that mean? If all the rest they could ever have was that outer rest they got when they took Canaan, right? right. Joshua gave them rest in a certain sense from their enemies, right? Yeah. But this is talking about another day. Look at verse 9. So there remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And what does that mean? It means that there's a place inside of us that no matter what's going on on the outside, we've been in prayer, and we've got victory, and we have the joy because we know it's going to be okay. And we, we never leave that rest. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Now that does not mean that you don't go to work in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, just thinking if you read Proverbs, Proverbs teaches hard work from chapter 1 to chapter 31. Hard work is part of God's plan for us. It's nothing to do with the physical labor, but it's talking about just striving and struggling and being anxious on the inside. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. If you could pull that up in the King James, I'm pretty sure the King James says, therefore let us labor to enter rest. Now all the my brain teasers that when I first started reading the Bible, I couldn't get that. But how do you labor to enter rest? You can labor or you rest, but how do you, okay? But I'm pretty sure that's what the, new, the King James says. It says, therefore, the new King James says, be diligent. Do we have the old King James? The old King James says, let us therefore labor to enter that rest. We're going to talk about what it means to stay in a place of rest. Wow. Now, before we can study these three chapters, two to four in Hebrews, do you know what the Hebrews, why the Hebrews is called the Hebrews? Because it was written to the people of the Old Testament. They knew the scriptures, and they're assuming that we know. So if you go back with me to Exodus 13, I'll give you the basic premise of the message, and that is that when you're first new in the Lord, the Lord is super patient with you. It's just all kinds of freebies. And good. Have you found that one? It's so easy to get your prayers answered from you. Go, tiny baby. And if you do complain, he understands you're a baby. But once you start growing up, he expects you to grow up. Yeah. So in Exodus 13, verse 17 to 18, um, this is when they were first out of Egypt. Let's read a few verses here. Now, when Pharaoh had let the people go from Egypt, God did not leave them by the way of the land of listings, even though it was near, for God said the people might change their minds and when they see war, return to Egypt. Did he do this out of love? He took them the long way around. You understand what I'm saying? There was a direct path to the promised land straight through the warlike to listings. That would not have been love because they weren't ready for it. Did you know sometimes when things take a little bit longer, it's because you're not ready for it. Yeah. Out of love, he said, we'll take them the long way. Verse 18. Hence, God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. And the sons of Israel went up in martial array from the land of Egypt. Skip to verse 21. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So let's stop for a moment here. They're on their way out of Egypt. Stop and remember. I wish we had time to read it all. But the Lord has turned the Nile into blood. Amen. He yes. sent plagues of frogs, flies, pestilence of cattle, boils, hail, locusts, and a darkness so deep that it could be felt. And in during the last plagues, the, the most remarkable part was that were the Egyptians, and he said, why did he send the place? He was trying to let he, uh, let Pharaoh know that he needed to let God's people go without that last plague. He never wanted that to happen. But every single time, Pharaoh resisted God. You see, he thought he was God. 
He could have waked up a little now for the blood and say, oh, I must not be God, all right? But every single time he hardened his heart worse. And, and during the last plagues, it was so supernatural that the pestilence came upon the Egyptian cattle, but not on the Hebrews' cattle. And then the darkness, it was such a darkness that said it felt. It was like somebody holding them in place. Nobody moved in Egypt for three days. But you know what? In Goshen, they had light. Now figure out that. How does one part of this big city have perfect light and they go about their business and there's a wall and there's darkness? Right. So we're, and he said, what is the point of all this? I want you to understand that they had seen the supernatural and possible miracles of God. They had every reason to believe God. Amen? Finally, there was the death of the firstborn, the wailing in Egypt, and yet because of the Lamb's blood, they came out unscathed. Right? Yeah. Did they have a reason to believe God? Yeah. Do you? Yes. 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 Yeah. That's right. These folks have seen the supernatural power and favor of God a time and time again. And at this point, the part we just read said that his presence, the presence of the Lord God Yahweh, was with them. They could see him. Did you read that verse? Which verse was it? 21 and 22? It said the sons of Israel went through the, oh, some of the light wrong chapter on the 14. 21, the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way in a pillar of fire by night. Can you imagine some stranger comes out and says, what is that wild thing? Is that a UFO? And they no, that's God. During the day, he gives us shade, and at night he gives us, you know, light and warmth. I mean, and you said, God doesn't do that. Oh, honey. God does stuff for you all day long that you're not aware of. Oh, wow. yeah. He guides you and gets you to the right spot and gives you favor and gives you wisdom and guides your days. We don't have a clue how much God does for us. And you say, well, I don't have a pillar of cloud. It's way better for you. He lives inside you. Yeah. Inside you. They follow one on the outside. We have fellowship inside, or at least we're supposed to. Yeah. So anyhow, in Exodus 14 now, everything's been going glorious for them. Pharaoh changes his mind, you know the story, and they're trapped between his army and the Red Sea. Let's look at 1419. They're screaming to God, saying, what are we going to do? The angel of God, who had been going before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved before them and stood behind them. So where they had been trapped between the army of Egypt and the Red Sea, and they're here, the pillar of cloud just stood right in between the Egyptian army and the Hebrews. That's pretty cool, huh? Yes. I wonder if God would ever do that for you. Yeah. does it all the time. You just don't see it with your physical eyes. All right, what verse did we get here? Verse. So it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel, and there was the cloud along with the darkness, and yet it gave light at night, and thus the one did not come near the other all night. Next verse. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, so the waters were divided. I know you know this story, but just think about how supernatural it is. The sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right and on their left. Now, let me ask you this. Was this a remarkable, memorable experience? You're walking on dry land with walls of water on both sides. Can you imagine the oppression that should have made? Hopefully, this is an unforgettable experience. Because what they forgot. Wow. Yeah. I'm telling you, God can do some mighty things for you. And if you're not careful, you can forget. Look at verse 25. Wow. When, they're, when the Egyptians tried to chase them down, it says the Lord caused the chariot wheels to swerve. And he made them drive with difficulty. So the Egyptians said, let us flee from Israel. For the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. And then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may come back over the Egyptians and over their chariots and over their horsemen. Verse 28. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army. Every, every single guy that had ever beat their back was laying their dead. All their enemies were gone. Not even one of them remained. This is at the end of the verse. But the sons of Israel walked through on dry land and through the midst of the sea. And the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians down at the seashore. This was an unforgettable experience. I mean, how would you like to see fear and everything else, poverty, debt, everything else you have ever just laid? You see, our enemies aren't yeah. humans. Okay. And I know you know these stories, but I want you to see how many supernatural kindnesses the Lord did for them. Amen? Yeah. Exodus 15, 22 to 25, you've got one continuous string of miracles. We're going to go from here to Hebrews. 
Because I don't think you can understand Hebrews unless this is fresh in your memory. Is that all right if we read a few more scriptures? Yeah. Hebrews 15, 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea. And they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore it was named Mara. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, well, what are we going to drink? And he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. Question. Have they been walking in one continuous string of miracles? Yeah. From the day Moses walked into Egypt, one string of miracles. A couple more at 16, and then things turned. Exodus 16, 2 to 4. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Have they learned much? No. no. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread in the full. We have it so good there, but in mine. <laughs> For you have brought us into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. For then they complained in the next few verses. They said, Well, we don't just want bread, we want meat. Look how good God is to them. Look at verse 12. The Lord says this, I have heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat. In the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it came about at evening that the quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. So they've got bread and meat that day, don't they? But when the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine plate like thing on this the cross. So look at this. They said, we're hungry, and he gives them bread. We don't just want bread, we want meat, and he gives them meat. Over and over here, there is not one word of reproof through all this, but I want to notice something. There is a tipping point. Oh. Yeah where God expects us to believe. Yeah. And in Exodus 17, they get the tipping point. And this is the verse that we're going we're gonna to see it referred to in Psalm 95. And in Hebrews, they keep coming back to this tipping point. So read, read with me a few more in, in Exodus 17, 1. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Now, wait a minute. Am I reading to you the same scripture? No, this is a different scripture. Have they been up against this wall before? Yes. 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 If somebody has proven himself before, what should your expectation be? Oh, Lord, here's what you do. This is the, the ideal. You go to the Lord and say, we are just want to let you know that we're so glad nobody's beating our backs today. We're so glad that our kids are going to belong to themselves and send us slave masters. We're so grateful you brought us out here. We're so glad for the water you gave us back there when you had to make it sweet at Mara. But guess what? We didn't have any water, and we just thought, since you're our God, we'd let you know. And yeah. you say, well, that should have been easy. It should be easy for you tomorrow morning, too. Yeah. You have to. <laughs> All right? Here's my point. They've been up against this before. They should have learned something. And God's patience, while it's long, is not forever. There comes a point. Now, listen, he didn't just reject them forever over this, but he called them on him. Yeah. Verse 2. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. That wasn't very nice. No thanks. No reminder. You were good to us before. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people were thirsty. They thirsted for water and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Aren't they sweet? Wow. <laughs> Are they accusing God of premeditated murder? Yes. Yeah. Verse 4. Wow. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do to these people? A little more, they're going to stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people, and take with you some of the elders, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there in the rock of the and you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he named that place Massa and Moriah. The margin of my Bible gives the, what those words mean. He named that place Test and Quarrel. Wow. Because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel, because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Now, you can, you can judge them. Come on. But how, which one of us can say that in our heart of hearts there's never been a time saying, Are you with me or not? Come on. Yeah. 
Now, hopefully we weren't quite that rude, but we've had that thought. We've had it, yeah. In the end, this argumentative, unbelieving generation, this was a turning point. We're going to see that. You see, God's patient, but we need to understand that he does expect us to grow up a little bit. In the end, this argumentative, unbelieving generation died in the wilderness because they did not honor the Lord and they did not believe his word. Yeah. If you go with me to Psalm 95, I'll show you that it refers directly to this passage of scripture in Exodus 17. Psalm 95, 6. This seems like a heavy message, but you know what I saw today when it says, let us lay together and rest, or let us be built. There's things that we can do to stay in rest. There, yeah, that went over big. Okay. I said, there's things that you, you see, you're here tonight because you recognize the need. The only people that come to church are people who recognize the need. As long as people figure they can make it on their own. Yeah. The, the wonderful thing about coming to church is that is you are saying, Lord, I just want you to know that I've depended on you up to here, and I'll depend on you tomorrow. So I'm here, Lord, how to depend. That would ever be, that's true. Psalm 90, verse 5, verse 6. The psalmist says this, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you want to hear his voice, or if you would hear his voice, don't harden your heart like they did at testing and quarrel. Yeah. That's what they named that place, right? Yeah. Test and quarrel. When your fathers tested me, and they tried me, even though what? They saw it soon as well. You know, the reason I wanted to read all, all those examples of miracles to you, you read this by itself, and they say, oh, they saw his work. I mean, they didn't just see his work, honey. They saw an entire mammoth river turn into blood. They saw hail and frogs and quail. I mean, they just, yeah. you name it, they saw God move on their behalf. And then when they came up one more time without water, they, instead of being kind and saying, Lord, you see, here's how we're supposed to live. We are supposed to live as a people who have a God. Yeah. We're supposed to live as the people whose lives are not our own. Our lives are completely his. Yeah. We're here tonight, Lord, to learn to serve you. Now, that, from that point on, if you're completely his, he's got a problem. It's called you. Yeah. Yeah. That, you can run the church on that one. Yeah. I am his problem. And you say, why are you excited about that? Because I know so many things I don't know how to do. It's just scary. I don't know how to fund the church. I don't know how to counsel people. I don't know how to do a zillion things. Guess what, Lord? If you call me, you've got a problem. Come on. Now, that's how you live in the rest of God. You live in the rest of God, first of all, by remembering. Do you know how many times the Lord, right in the middle, when they finally, 40 years later, this whole generation died in the wilderness because of, of their cocky, snotty attitude toward God? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of mistakes that you can make, but one that you do not want to be is to be snotty toward God. Come on. Come on. The humility will get you yeah. anywhere with God. But when they finally went through 40 years later, right in the middle, if you remember how he brought them across the flood stage, he said, Joshua, stop. Before you take over, now that they're all across the river, you go back and you take 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel and you make a great big pile. And you take another 12 stones and you make, mound them up right in the middle of the river. So that that pile will be visible all year long. And when your kids say, what is that? They say, did you see that river out there? Right at flood stage, God stopped it. Miles upstream, instead of dividing the Red Sea like he did the Red Sea, read it in, in Joshua. He stopped it miles upstream and it just became a big pile up there. It says the water's piled up. He said, when your kids ask you, what are those stones? You remember. You yeah. say, God brought us across on dry land. And then when the Jordan dries up, because it almost completely dries up at parts of the year, and those stones down in the middle reappear, they say, what's that? That's to remind us. Why? Because we forget. Yeah. Yeah. We true. forget. God yeah. does such magnificent things for us. Yeah. And we forget. Yeah. After I was teaching my, our Sunday, we talked on, on the fact that if you give $100 in the offering, that is not the same effect on your you set fire to it. No. Some people yeah. some people believe that. Are you kidding me? That's a living seed that's going to produce. Yeah. And you know people that they said, well, I don't tithe anymore, but I remember when I was tithing, that happened. I got a thousand dollars just out of the blue. And I thought, I'm glad you remember that. <laughs> we forget. How we forget. How we forget. I'm going to give you an illustration. What if 
they had played a game called 20 questions with their kids. I said, what was the first one? And he said, where did you come up with 20 questions? Okay. My grandparents were late missionaries in the Philippines. And when I was five years old, they went over there for two years and they taught. During the day, my grandfather taught them construction. He's a very good house builder. And my grandmother taught them to sew. And in the evenings, they teach Bible classes. They weren't ordained ministers, but my grandpa filled many pulpits here as a lay minister. And they spent two years. We, my dad's an only child, so they have a small family. They came up with the idea that we should meet them in London. My grandma missed her two little grandkids so much. And so when I was seven years old, out of the hills of Ohio, having been absolutely nowhere, we got on a plane and went over there, and we spent three weeks, two in the British Isles and one in France. And, you know, that is a big deal when you're a little kid in the hills of Ohio, you've never been anywhere. My parents understood that we were very young. I was just ready to turn seven. It was a month before I turned seven, and my little sister was a month before she turned five. And my dad was a psychology major. He has his PhD in psychology. And he said, if we could keep these memories in the forefront of their thinking instead of letting them get buried, they would remember. And so they would use this. We would ride. We played 20 questions. And it could be any, you know, in three weeks, you just run into so many unusual people, especially if it's in a foreign culture, because everything's unusual in a foreign culture. And they would, it would, it would be a food somewhere or something. And we had to track them down and figure out, were they thinking of a dinner we had had somewhere or a funny bike? We came across a guy in a kilt up in Scotland, just right in the middle of nowhere in a waterfall, and you could hear the bagpipes, and you thought you were hallucinating. We stopped, and it was a certain dog summer, and, they the name, and we had our pictures taken with it. Well, we, okay, and he said, what's the point? They played that with us for years, and because they played that game, you could ask us questions about Europe many years later, and we could still remember, because they didn't let the memories get buried. It was like still living and fresh, because they had been doing yeah. questions with us. And as I'm studying this today, I thought, oh, that these children of Israel had just played some 20 questions with their kids about what happened to, to what happened to the Goshen when they had darkness so bad, so heavy it was out like a hand. And they said, we had light. And they would just have remembered when the thirst came, instead of paying attention to that overwhelming thirst, they, they would have at least been respectful and gone to God, gone to God and said, you've been so faithful. A hundred times out of a hundred, yeah. when we made it, you've come through. I just, we're really thirsty. You know, you can ask for a glass of water without accusing of a murder. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's look at this. It says, verse 8, don't harden your hearts as a testing and quarrel when your fathers tested me. Then look at verse 10. This is for 40 years. I'll know that generation. I mean, they finally just turned him to his stomach with their ingratitude, their unbelief. And they said, and said they are a people who err in their heart and they do not know my ways. Therefore, I swore in my anger. They're not going to enter my rest. I don't think we understand what a terrible punishment is not to enter God's rest. If you ask most people or most Christians, what is the punishment for unbelief? You say, well, you don't receive your healing. Or you don't receive what you're believing for. You follow them? But there's an even greater punishment. And, the, and it isn't that God's against us. The devil is the one that kicks us in the teeth. Do you understand that? It doesn't tell us very much in the Old Testament about the devil. He hadn't been defeated yet. He was too big and bad and ugly. The Lord just kind of left it there until the New Testament. You find out, wow, John's coming from the devil. Greater than not receiving your healing is living agitated. Yeah. Greater than having all your bills not paid just yet is living vexed. Come on. And upset. Come on. Yeah. Amen. The greatest punishment that came on them for this rude, snotty attitude toward God was when he said, you're not going to enter my rest. But you know, the reward for trusting, you know, we don't have to go there. It's like Solomon, what is the reward if we decide I'm going to be diligent to enter that rest? You just decide, you know what, the one who has brought me this far, the Bible says he caught you. And you came out of your mother's womb. You thought the doctor caught you? But look at Isaiah 46. It says, I've born you I caught from your mother's womb. Five times in that chapter it says, I've carried you. The oh, one who's done, you, Lord. Yeah. you need to place 20 questions with yourself and say, where would I have been? Where were my kids headed? I prayed and prayed and look how they, God turned my kids' lives around. Amen. How many of you can say, I've seen my kids' lives turn toward God through prayer? You, it doesn't, nothing is more important than that. For your kids to know God, there's nothing more important. You need to celebrate that. And you're saying, well, why? Number one, God deserves the glory. 
Damn. If your hands are serving God and you're grateful, God deserves the glory. And number two, your faith is not only predicated on what you read in this word. Your faith is predicated on remembering what God has done. Amen? Yeah. When, when, God, when the devil says, oh, God's not going to save all your family, you say, well, he saved my dad. Amen. You know what I'm saying? you got to remember. Amen. This is good. The reward for trusting and believing God is righteousness and peace and joy and rest in the Holy Spirit. If you go to Psalm 106, we only have a few more minutes, almost done. Uh, we haven't even gone back to Hebrews. We did all that, so we go to Hebrews. Oh, dear. <laughs> but you get the point that there's a rest in God. That, that you don't just fall apart when the new, when the new issue comes up. Because there will be issues until the day Jesus comes or yeah. you go home. Mm -hmm. yeah. Psalm 106. We're going to read verses 6 to 10. It's talking about the same generation. The psalmist says, We've sinned like our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We've behaved wickedly. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember your abundant kindnesses, but they rebelled at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for the sake of his name. Have you ever been saved for the sake of his name? Not because we had great faith, but because he was merciful. I have. Yeah. <laughs> He saved them for the sake of his name, that his power might be made known. Thus he rebuked the Red Sea, and it dried up, and he led them through the deeps as through the wilderness. So he saved them from the hand of the one who hated them, hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Now that's cool, but look at verse 12. Then they believed his words, they sang his praise. Look at verse 13, they quickly forgot his words. Wow. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it just goes like this. Oh, they're on a great high. I mean, wow. well, God wants us to come to a place where we realize we will be nothing without him. Come on. His anointing is what wakes us up in the morning. It's the grace of God. If you've got good, how many have got good health? You don't have to struggle with health. Do you know what a blessing that is? Yes. What a blessing it is to have good health. I mean, we need to celebrate every bit of goodness. Yeah. It says they quickly forgot his works and they did not wait for his counsel. They craved intensely in the wilderness and tempted or tested the Lord their God. Now listen to this. Our faith only vacillates. How many of you have a faith issue today where there's one thing that your faith is working on? If you could fix one thing, you know what you tell God to fix. Come on. Oh, yeah. Come there's on. There's not one person Definitely. here. Who doesn't, you came to church tonight because he had you. Okay. Our faith only vacillates when we forget his innumerable kindnesses. Yes. If you come to a Thanksgiving dinner here, give everybody 30 seconds and we have a little bell to ring if they have. They've not done it very otherwise it would take forever. We'd be here until four in the morning. And you listen to everything God's done in one year, you just forget. Yeah. You just forget. And you hear it. Your faith is just like oh, up there for whatever it is you need. Amen. You are in a faith battle for your destiny and for the desires of your heart. That is an unavoidable and non-negotiable fact of life because it's the way the Lord set things up. You won't fulfill your destiny without faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. Amen? Jesus approached every day from a position of rest and victory because he had won that battle in prayer because when he entered the Father's presence in the morning. You go out and for Jesus, you need to go find him praying in the morning. Yeah. He had the victory when he started the day. Yeah. Adam and Eve plunged us into this mess because they flunked the face test. They doubted the absolute goodness of God. What did the serpent say? You know that if you eat that, God is so selfish. He's held that back from you. You'll be good and evil. You'll be as wise as God. What a bunch of malarkey. They doubted his goodness. Yes. If they believed his goodness, they said, look, we don't know why we can't eat that tree. But guess what? We're not eating. <laughs> when you know his goodness, you'll side with him. St. Augustine said this. He said, my heart is restless until it finds its rest in me. Come on. There is a place where every single morning you say, what does it mean? Labor to enter into rest. Be diligent to enter into rest. Well, the, the first thing you do is you, you tell God, I understand that my life would be nowhere as wonderful if you were not in it. You yeah. have been so good to me. Oh, you've been good to me. And then you say, I also understand that I did pretty good yesterday, but it was 100% because of your grace. You made me look better than I am. Thank you for your goodness. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. And then as you say, I just wanted to tell you, I will be needing your help. <laughs> Come on. And, 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 I, and I recognize that, and I welcome it. And if I'm starting to get off, would you please tap me on the shoulder and get my attention? Yeah. Let's, do we have five more minutes? Five more minutes. Go to Hebrews. This is why we read all these, was so that Hebrews would make sense. 
You see, he wrote to the Hebrews thinking they knew the scriptures. Amen. You understand? Yeah. yeah. There were a group of people that knew what we just read. Right. Yeah. It's going to be real fast here, and I think it's going to make sense. He's talking about how some people are walking away. Hebrews 2 1 says, For this reason, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard so that we don't drift away from it. What do we have to pay attention to? The gospel. It's got to be real important to us for us to stay up in our faith. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Is this salvation that we run to in a time of trouble, is it a great salvation? It is. is it not to be neglected? Yes. Who chooses whether you neglect it or not neglect it? We yeah, we have to choose not to neglect it. Neglect. After it wasn't the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testified with them, both by signs and wonders and various miracles. Now, there's a whole, I know that we went through that when we passed, but look at verse 3. It says, first of all, the Lord Jesus preached this gospel to us. Then it was confirmed by the preachers that we've heard, and then it was confirmed by all that God did in our lives. How many of you have ever seen a testing miracles? Yeah. Yeah. Now look at Hebrews 3, 7 to 8. Talk about the same thing of entering breath. This is going to refer back to the place where they messed up so bad. Hebrews 3, 7. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says today, hear his voice. What are you supposed to do if God starts speaking to you? Listen. Have a tender heart. It says, don't harden your hearts as when they provoke me. As in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tried me by testing me. Testing quarrel, testing quarrel. Yeah. Because of it, they saw my works for 40 years. Wow. That is a long time. Can our unbelief become a vexation to God? Does it grieve the Holy Spirit? Oh, yeah. And the thing is, is we say, well, what do I care about God? Well, first of all, we care about God because we love him. Yeah. We want to please him. But the other thing is, is you can have a happy day or a bad day right in the middle of the same exact set of circumstances. Right. Yeah. Come on. It, you, it isn't the outside circumstances that decide whether you're having an awesome day. Come it's on. whether you've got the victory over it in prayer. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Verse 9 says, For your fathers tried me by touching me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation. He's talking about Exodus 17. It said that they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my breath. Right, ways. As I swore in my wrath, they'll never enter my rest. They're not going to enter. Now that did mean the promised land physically. But what I'm trying to help you see today, there is also a promised land. You're very few days. I had a day the other day where it just seemed like everything went right the whole thing. I was like, hey, my mom was hanging over about three. <laughs> it was a throne zone thing and everything went right. When a throne zone thing goes, uh, you understand? Casey's he's been there. Not everybody who comes to throne someone wants to behave exactly like an angel, you know. We have to understand, that's really rare. That's remarkable. Most of your days on earth are going to have a few glitches of them. How many of uh, that out without yeah, sure. okay. But God says, I want you to enter something called rest. Yeah. Jesus said, come to me, I will give you rest. I want to talk... How, what is it? Look at verse 11. As I swore my wrath, they'll not enter my rest. What's the worst thing about unbelief? Not only does it rob us of the answer of prayer, there's no rest and there's no holy ease. There's a place in God where you have prayed and you know he's heard and you know he has the problem. And you can live in a holy ease even if you can't prove it to anybody and you can't see it. God wants our lives to be lived from a position, position of victory because he has already established a track record of blessing in our lives. How many of you say, if you were, back, you were pinned to the wall, you'd have to say, he has established a track record of blessing. Yeah. More than what you give him credit for, even in your own mind. How many of you agree that you need to play some 20 questions with yourself and say, let's start thinking of everything he's done for me in the last three years? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Isn't that good? We know better than to believe our eyes if we uh, trust the word of God. You know, when something comes up, the devil's job is to make it look like God doesn't care. You understand yeah. that? Amen. And that's the line. It's our job to stay on top of things and to remember that he does care. The Lord takes unbelief as a direct insult because he's been so overwhelmingly good to us. And um, we do want to interrupt. There's one thing here. What can, just to conclude, what can rob us of rest, number one? Staying agitated or mad about something or anything. Oh, 
holding a grudge. Yeah. I have never known an angry person who ever has a moment's complete rest. Yeah. And you say, well, he's getting quiet in here. Come on. I'm telling the truth. Yeah. If I don't care if it's just one grudge against one person. If there is a place in the deepest part of your heart that you're deeply angry because somebody did you wrong, you have no complete rest. Come on. I'm talking about everything's good. My God is God, and I don't, I'm don't. i not mad at one person. I think I get as far as I'm thinking, you know, you have to keep this up to date. Yeah. It's not like last week I forgave everybody for the rest of my life, and I'll never have to forgive anybody again. Would that be love? Like, oh, you have to keep it. Forgive it up. That's what Brother Kate called. Stay forgiving up. Forget. Stay forgiving up. I'm looking at my heart right now. I think I can say there's not one person on earth that I got the slightest grudge and you say, How can you say that? Aren't there people that try to hurt the ministry? Yeah. But do you know what I found? Well, listen, the anointing of God will defend you against anything and anybody. If you'll walk in love, you walk in the anointing, you do not have to defend yourself. Amen. So what can rob us of rest staying agitated? You, and you say, well, what do you do? Number one, you repent of having a hard heart. Mm -hmm. Because you can't have a grudge without a hard heart. A tender yes. heart forgives. Amen. A hard heart stays mad. If there's somebody you say, that part I will never forgive. I will never throw my arms around that person and tell them I love them again. You have a hard heart. And you need to go home and pray until you get over it. Yeah. And you say, why are you being so blunt? Because it's robbing you. It's robbing you of rest. Do you know how good it is to go to bed at night and know that there is one person on the world that I don't roll the best for? Lord, I roll the very, I don't want to be the best chums for some people. Neither do you. But I roll the best toward them with all my heart. So number one, what they're obviously resting in bed. Number two, not praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in tongues is a way to tap into the supernatural strategies. If, the longer I live, the more aware I am of the fact that God overcomes by strategies. I don't care what it... Have you ever had schedule glitches where you think, how in the world is all this going to happen? God has a strategy. What you do is you go to God and say, look, this is where I'm at. I need your strategy. What is your mind? When things have come up on this Mexico trip, because we're kind of figuring it out as we go, it's brand new territory, I would just go to God and say... God, this is your idea. You must have a strategy. Please give us your strategy. Yeah. When you pray in tongues, you pray out the perfect will of God in this strategy. Look at Isaiah 28. I know we have stuff. But look at Isaiah 28, 10 to 12. We're on the last scripture. He said, excuse me, order on order, line on line, a little here, a little there. Indeed, he will speak to this people through stammering lips and a foreign tongue. Bible scholars agree that this is speaking speaking tongues. He who said to them, here's rest, give rest to the weary. Here's repose. But they wouldn't listen. I really believe that if we prayed in tongues more, there would just be a, a, more of a glide to our days, a holy ease. Yeah. When you pray in the Holy Spirit, you are enabling the Holy Spirit to, not just, we think, we're praying in tongues so that he works out the big overarching destiny. Sometimes I don't worry about my big overarching destiny. Sometimes I'm just going to try to make it through the day. Yeah. I don't think it's just praying out your destiny. It's praying out that day. Yeah. Isn't that good? Yeah. So number one, what can rob us of rest? Staying mad, not praying in the Holy Spirit, or believing your eyes and ears instead of believing the Word of God. Why were they so stinking rude to the living God? Oh, they were rude. Were they not rude? Why? Because they'd look at something and the devil say, He didn't care. How many of you have ever been tempted? Yeah. But when you, when you, what you do is you say, hey, wait a minute, before I say those rude words to the one who died for me, yeah. let's just back up here, yeah. Yeah. take a little inventory, yeah. <laughs> answer prayers. Come on. Our, here's our biggest problem. We come to a place where we're used to getting 29 out of 30 prayers answered. Yeah. And if something happens on that 30th one, we're most righteously indignant. Uh -oh. Not as never occurring to us that it could have been our fault. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Okay, that's what I have for you. I hope it helps. God wants us to live in rest in a place of so much faith that even when we can't prove it, we know he's got it. He's got our backs. Amen? Amen? Now, John is in New York. He usually prays right now. Um, does anybody have praise reports? First of all, I know we took them earlier. Praise reports. What about um, written prayer requests? I definitely want to pray for Michelle. She's having surgery on her knee. Are you still having surgery, Colleen? Okay, can we pray for you too? Yes. We'll just lay hands on you, believe God to facilitate it, and um, 
Anybody else want prayer? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I see the Lord really working in my brother's life, my little brother, and um, he was actually going to come tonight, but um, he wasn't able to. So I, I really see his heart being softened. He's okay. in a it's been a pretty tough situation. He's kind of been for the past few years. So I, I, I pray for him every day. Um, so, like, I would love for people to pray with me as well. Okay. Yes. I uh, travel mercies for my family and I will be heading back to Iowa on Sunday. Okay. What's your first name? I'm sorry. Brian. Brian. Okay. And your brother's name I know, Troy. It's, it's Troy. Troy. Yeah. Okay. Brian and Troy. Let's go ahead and pray for them and then we'll lay hands on Michelle. <laughs> Lord, we're just so grateful for your mercy for every time that we have given you less than the respect that you deserve. And we've all done it, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for forgiveness. Yeah. We just want to acknowledge your goodness and say thanks, thanks, thanks. You have been so good to us. Thank we thank you for hearing um, Jason's prayer for his brother Troy. And we just believe you just set him 100% free from anything that binds him, Lord. Help him to know truth in his innermost being. Help them to sort out thoughts where he knows truth and discerns it, where he loves you and serves you. And we trust you for that in Jesus' name. Total, complete salvation and deliverance and safety for him. Fill him with your Holy Spirit. And Father, we pray for Brian and his family that you'll get them back to Iowa safely. We're so grateful for all you've done for them. Lord, we just stop and thank you as a congregation for being good to us. We pray for the trip coming up Sunday, that you will have your hand upon every single person involved in it, Lord, for wisdom and anointing. We believe you, Lord, that there will be so many salvations, so many people baptized in the Holy Spirit. Wait, may every spiritual leader there, Lord, get baptized in the Holy Ghost and 